Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. So, uh, let's see, nothing really procedural to talk about. It's all normal. Um, well, your first graded quiz has been scammed. <laughs> <laughs> Your first graded quiz has been scanned, uh, and it's in the grade book. So, so that so that that's a first. Uh, well, quiz zero was graded, in the sense that if you did it at all, then you received full credit. But quiz one has been graded. So, any procedural questions? Okay. So, um, last time we ended with average value, so let's take a few last looks at that. So I don't think we, we didn't get to do many exercises, maybe we didn't do one. We just, we just had talked about what it was. So average value. Yes? Okay, so, so a subset of the written homeworks are graded, not all of them, but what I mean is graded by hand. Those are graded out of 10. You'll see one of the bubbles will be filled in at the bottom. Uh, so symbolically, that's 0 through 9 or A, where A means 10. And the reason why A means 10 is because 10 wouldn't fit inside of that last bubble. So I made it an A. Okay, then of, of, that's of the ones that are graded. Of the ones that are not graded, they are counted as completion. They're graded out of one. And if you completed the assignment without regard to whether or not you completed it correctly, then you're given one out of one. But I, I denote that as a C for complete because I didn't want to write it as a one because when I first started doing that, people were crawling up, you know, <laughs> banging my door down saying, why are you giving me a one on this thing? And I have to explain so many times, it's one out of one. So, <laughs> so I write a C. And then B means blank that you didn't do it at all. Other questions? Uh, for average value. So just as a reminder, er everyone knows before they got here uh, how to do a discrete average, which is to say, suppose that I give you a list of 50 numbers and I say compute the average. Well, you would do that by adding them all up and dividing by 50 because there were 50 numbers. Suppose you do that. Suppose I gave you a list and suppose you carried out that procedure and you determined that the average was 13. <clears throat> now suppose further that I take that list of 50 things and I replace all of them, each, with a 13. So now you have the first one is a 13, the next one is a 13, the next one is a 13, they're all 13. They have this constant value of 13. What's the average of this new list? 13. That's what it means, that's part of what it means to say that 13 is the average, is that if you were to take all of the numbers and replace them with the average, then the resulting average would be unchanged. Okay, this constant value. So what we did last time is we extended this trick, this notion, to a function which doesn't have finitely many values, <coughs> It has infinitely many values. Okay? So, the average value of f of x on a to b. So 
that's the interval, <coughs> and this, the function. <coughs> Uh, what we want, what we want is now instead of like in the the, the discrete case where we had 50 numbers and we pre we wanted to replace them all with this constant number 13. Now we're saying that we we want to replace f <coughs> function f, which is not constant. You can see it's not constant because it goes up and down. We want to replace it with a constant function so that the two areas are the same. The area under the red, the area under f, is the same as the area under some constant function. Okay, and then just eyeballing it, you can see how much area is in there. The trick is to draw a rectangle, a straight line, so that you, the amount of area that's under is the same as the amount of area that's over. So, what, I, what I'm telling you is that this is the average value value of f of x on a to b because This area is the same as this area. Okay, so that what it, that's what it means to have found the average value of a function on an interval. Then we established how to find that formula. The way to find that formula is uh, with this. So 1 over uh, b minus a integral a to b f of x dx. So that is to say that this formula <coughs> this formula tells you that value. Okay, so any question about the concept or the formula? <coughs> okay, well, for example, Find the average value of f of x is the square root of x plus 1 on the interval 3 to 8. So this is a direct application of that formula above. <clears throat> ah, but before I, before I do that though, I'd like to point out this is the this is the average formula for um, for a continuous function. That's the formula for average value for a discrete set. Like if I said, here's 50 numbers, find their average value. What uh, what is the formula? Well, it's 1 over n, the sum from i is 1 to n of a i. So what I want you to see is that these, these two formulas are in direct correspondence to each other. Because what is the size of this interval? Or, if you like, what is the size of this interval? 3 to 8, but what's its size? How big is it? What's its length? 
5, right? <coughs> minus 3. So this is length 5. That's how big it is. What's the length of this one? B minus A. So we're dividing by B minus A. We're dividing by the size. If I asked you to compute the average of 50 values, you'd have to divide by 50. Okay, so what I want you to see is that this corresponds to this, right? Dividing by the number of things that you're averaging, dividing by the size of the interval you're averaging over, and the other two parts are also in correspondence, right? Adding up all the pieces, adding up the finitely many pieces, adding up the infinitely many pieces. So these formulas are directly comparable, at least um, conceptually. Okay, so for this formula, we're going to have to end up dividing by what to get the answer? By 5, because that is an interval of size 5. So 1 over 8 minus 3, <coughs> integral 3 to 8, square root x plus 1 dx. Is there any question why in the end this is what you must do? Okay, so I'll do some minor things. Uh, 1 fifth integral 3 to 8 and then when you're doing algebra the radicals are nice but when you're doing calculus the fractional exponents are nice so I'm gonna rewrite that as fractional exponent half dx. So, we'd love to use the fundamental theorem. That really makes things nice. Um, I claim that the antiderivative corresponding to this is so simple that you ought to, at this point, be able to do it in your head, I think. Okay? So the reason why I say that is if you were to insist, now I'm going to show every single conceivable step, <laughs> then you'd have to do a substitution. What would be the substitution? You'd say u is x plus 1. And then the differential du would be dx. <coughs> but when you, substitutions that take this structure when you're just renaming a differential, those are, those, that's like the easy mode of a substitution, right? It can't get any easier than that. So on this variety, it, it's time for you to start getting to the point where you can do it without it. Uh, so this would be one-fifth, and then what's the antiderivative? Very good. And then we'll need to evaluate this from 3 to 8. Now division by 3 halves is multiplication by 2 thirds. So that would be 2 over 15. Uh, then x plus 1 to 3 halves from 3 to 8. I'll leave that 2 over 15 factored out and get 2 over 15 multiplied by, okay, so if you plug in 8, that'd be 9 to 3 halves minus, if you plug in 3, that'd be 4 to 3 halves. And 9 to 3 halves is something that you should be able to do without a calculator. So what is it? 27. And how did you do that? I'm sorry? I'm not sure I follow you. So how, how do you evaluate 9 to exponent 3 halves? How is it that you do that? I agree that it's 27. Alternatively, what is 4 to 3 halves? It's 8. Well, how do you do that? 
Well, as an aside, in case this bit of college algebra didn't, didn't uh, take real well the first time, 9 to 3 halves, the way you evaluate fractional exponents is you evaluate the fractional part first, that is to say 9 to exponent 1 half, and then raise it to exponent 3. Because when you have exponents that are iterated, then you multiply them, right? So then I'm, it's like I'm factoring out the 3. If you were to multiply 3, and a half, three multiplied by 1 half, you'd have 3 halves. Well, what is 9 to, what is nine to exponent 1 half? It's 3. And then 3 to exponent 3 is 27. So similarly, this, what this expression is saying, is asking you to do, well, what's the square root of 4? It's 2. And then what's 2 cubed? That's 8. So like uh, 4 to the 5 halves is what? Well, what's the square root of 4? 2. And then what's 2 to 5? 32. Good. So this would be 2, 15, 2 over 15, and then 27 minus 8. 27 minus 8 is 19, which is a prime. So there's no cancellation. It'd be 38 over 15. Any question about this one? So what it's saying, what it's saying is that you could draw the square root function. Okay, that's like a parabola turned on its side. Okay? On the interval 3 to 8, this particular square root function, the average value is 38 over 15, which is a little more than 2. It's like 2 and a half. So that's saying that you could replace that bendy thing, that the, the graph that's not straight, with a straight graph of height what? Thirty eight over fifteen, and those two would have the same area under them. Okay. Let's try another one. So I gave kind of an adventurous uh, <clears throat> average value problem on the written homework. So let's, let's do an adventurous one um, here. So consider consider f of x <coughs> is 5 divided by x squared on the interval 1 to t for t greater than 1, a parameter. So in the first place, what I want you to do is I want you to plot, uh, I want you to plot f of x on 1 to t. Let's think about it. So here's the axis. And first thing is that, well, maybe this is 1. And then, so if 1's there, what do we know about t? It's just all that we know is it's some, some distance to the right. It might be really close. It might be really far. 
So I'm just going to draw it right here. Now, we want to draw uh, the function. Uh, f of x is 5 over x squared. Well, from college algebra, there's a whole uh, list of functions that it's just expected that you know what they look like. So, so right here, I'm going to draw 5 over x squared. What does it look like? What does 5 over x squared look like? It's, it's not u-shaped. If, it if it was 5 times x squared, it would definitely be u-shaped. It'd be a problem. But 5 divided by x squared, no. So let's think about this for a moment. What if... What if x is big, like 10? What's, what's 5 over 10 squared? Well, what is 10 squared? 100, right? So that'd be 5 over 100. So that'd be a small positive number. Let's make x bigger. What if x is 1,000? What's 1,000 squared? A million, right? So that'd be five over a million. It'd be an even smaller, but still positive number. What if, what if x were, say, a half? What's one half squared? <coughs> one half squared is one fourth, right? One fourth. And then what's five divided by one fourth? 20. Oh, so it's getting big. Do you observe that the smaller, as long as x is positive, the smaller x gets, the larger 5 over x squared gets. Okay, so part of this function looks like this. So that goes all the way up, right? Straight up. And then you've got a reflection of it on the other side. So that's what 5 over x squared looks like. Now, for those of you that weren't real sure about that, so let this just be a warning. Uh, I have been and will continue to assume that you know what all of these functions look like. Okay, so if you don't know what they look like, if, if you didn't immediately know that 5 over x squared looks like that, then that's a warning to you, and you need to get open your college algebra book to the section about plotting, and you'll have a whole big page, or, or even two pages, of just this is what these kind of functions look like, these are what those kind of functions look like. You've got to know what they look like, because I simply must assume that you know. Okay, so that being the case, Let's plot what we have here. So if you plug in 1 into f, you'd get 5. So this is the point 1, 5. And if you plug in t, because t is to the right of 1, it's going to be something a little lower, right? Something like this. And then it's going to, it's going to be bowing down. And this would be the point, uh, this would be the point t comma 5 over t squared. Okay, so any question about the way it looks? Okay. So 2, I want you to uh, find the value of t such that 
uh, the average value of f of x on 0 to t, uh, no, 1 to t, on 1 to t is 0 0.1326. So let's make sure that we understand what's being requested. So what I want you to imagine is that in this drawing, the T uh, fence post can be moved around. It can be moved left. It can be moved right. The only requirement is it has to be on the right side of 1. So it can move like this, but it, it, can't, it can't go past 1. So like this, right? So what I want you to see is that if t is really close, because, because this height right here, because that height is 5, if we make t really close to 1, then the average value of that function on that small interval that you can see might be something like 4.5. The average value might be something like four and a half. And then if I pull t to the right a little bit, well, now the average value might be something like four. And if I pull it to the right even further, uh, maybe now the average value is three and a half. So do you observe that the further I pull t to the right, the lower the average value gets? So. My question, the question that's being asked, can someone, can someone in, in terms of this, this fence post and moving it around, can someone say what this question is asking? So I'll, I'll make another attempt. That's what we want to get. It would be like, it would be like we've got a readout here. And on the readout, it's telling us the average value. So this is like the average value readout. So average value. And suppose that presently the readout is saying something like 1.85. Yeah, so we have to keep going to the right. Okay, you can imagine that I'm, I'm wiggling this around and we're watching the average value readout move around. We want to pull this all the way to the right until the readout says 0 0.1326. So does everyone understand what's being requested? Because, because that's, that's the key to such an exercise. Once you get to the once you get down to an integral, then it's just, it's all downhill from there. So this, what's, what's going to be the strategy then? How are we going to accomplish this? So what's the strategy? Well, so we're not going to we're not going to do it approximately. We're going to solve we're going to do it exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's think about it. Let's think about it. If we were to compute the average value. So if in the first place, so 2.1. If we compute the average value of f of x on the interval 1 to t, then that depends on t, right? If we come up with, a, if we come up with an expression for that, it's going to depend on t. That's what it means when you say that if I move this fence post around, that little average value readout will be moving. 
By moving the t around, that average value is moving around. So this, this will depend on t. So now supposing we do that, supposing that we come up with the average value on the interval 1 to t, what, what are we supposed to do next? What are we supposed to do next? So, yeah? Are we supposed to find t? Or OK. So what do you think? Don't we have the average values? We, we know what we want the average value to be. We know we want it to be 0 0.1326. But what we want to find out is what t value do we need. Do we need t to be 13? Do we need t to be 13 million? What, what t will do this for us? That's what we're trying to figure out. So what do we do? It, so, supposing that we've done this, supposing that we have calculated the average value, no more calculus will be necessary after that. We'll need calculus to compute the average value. But to finish out the problem, we won't need calculus. What will we need? Yeah. So then, from here, we'll take this expression, take this expression set it equal to 0 0.1326 and solve for t so does everyone understand the strategy the game plan because that's what's really important here, is, learn, is, is understanding how to go about attacking such an exercise. The actual pencil and paper mechanics of writing it all down is pretty straightforward. But do you understand why this is the, this is the sequence of events with, that have to occur? Okay. So, to compute the average value. What will be the formula for the average value? One over t minus one, and then what? Integral from one to t, Very good. 5 over x squared dx. OK. So this is 1 over t minus 1, integral 1 to t. And then I'm going to write it as 5x to negative 2 dx. Because that, using negative, negative exponents, is better for calculus. So then that's one of the antiderivatives we know. So that'd be 1 over t minus 1. That 5 just hangs out because it's a constant multiple. And then what is the antiderivative of x to negative 2? Almost. So what, ru what rule do, will we use to anti-differentiate x to negative 2? 
Right, the add one rule. Right, so it'll be x to negative one and then divide by negative one, right? So then this will be from one to t. So now I'm gonna simplify this a little bit. I'll put the five on top of that and I'll spend the negative by doing what? How can I get rid of that negative? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, yeah, I'm gonna change the order of evaluation. So this will be five over t minus one. And I'm gonna write x to negative one as one over x. So times one over x, and now switch the order of evaluation t to one. Okay, so now I'm going to evaluate. Five over t minus one times uh, well, 1 minus 1 over t. So that's the average value for some t. Now, we could do, for example, we could plug in t as 100 into that expression. 5 over 99 times 1 minus 1 over 100. And we could, we could type that into the calculator and it would give us some value. And what we hope, what we want and need, is for that value to be 0 0.1326. Okay? So now what do we do? We set that equal to point. Yes. So now we're going to solve. 5 over t minus 1 times 1 minus 1 over t equal 0 0.1326. Because when we figure out the t that does that, that's the answer to the question. Okay? Well, in the interest of time, I'll show you how to do it. The trick is that we want to represent this as a single fraction. So you could do the cross multiply thing, right? Construing this as being one over one. If you do the cross multiply thing, this would be t minus one over t, like so. The t minus ones cancel. You've got t minus one there and t minus one there so that you get the equation 5 over t is 0 0.1326. And then you do the usual thing, and you can get 5 over 0 0.1326 is t. And you can type this into the machine. And typing that in the machine, I get, I'll round it to two places past the decimal, 37.71. So what does that mean in the picture? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So if we were at, if we were at say, uh, 15 right now, right, I'd have to grab it and, and pull it over, 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 so that the average value would come down, 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 down to 0 0.1326. And if I was over here at 100, that'd be, wait, that'd be too far. I'd have to come back, 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 back to 37.71 to get the answer. So any question about this one? Okay. So now for a completely different topic. So now we're in money. So this section is called money flows.
So in order to get an understanding of this, uh, we need to have just a little bit of discussion. So imagine uh, a large Walmart, say, in an urban area. Now, at, at such a Walmart, at peak, at peak uh, sales times, <clears throat> you know, they've got lots of the registers open and all of that. Um, <clears throat> the number of transactions, that is to say, the register has completed a transaction per minute at, a lar at such a large Walmart, you know, that might be several tens of transactions per minute. It could be a lot of them at, at uh, a peak time. And then <clears throat> when, when you're off peak time, say in the middle of the night where they're restocking shelves and, and otherwise making the store prepared for the next peak, uh, the, the number of transactions per minute can, can go down. Okay, be kind of slow. <coughs> but if you were to take like Walmart corporate, and then if you were to aggregate all of those transactions, then because there's so many Walmarts, there's something like 4,000 Walmarts, <laughs> I think, worldwide. Uh, if you were to aggregate those all onto a big screen or something, the transactions would be coming really rapidly, essentially at all times of the day. But they'd, there'd still be discrete events, right? Click, click, click. So what I want you to imagine is that we've, we've got a situation where the number of transactions are coming so quickly that we're going to consider it to be a continuous event. Continuous in the same sense that when you're holding a water hose and the water hose is turned on, the water is continuously pouring out. Okay, like a, Now, th that's a perfectly understandable thing, but do understand that water does not continuously pour out of the water hose. It really doesn't. Because in the end, water is composed of discrete molecules, right? So, it's not. <laughs> but, what I'm saying is we're going to do the same thing with money. In fact, let's just literally imagine that we have a hose and money's coming out of it. Okay? And <laughs> that's going to be our conceptual model for a money flow. Somehow, we've got a hose and money is continuously coming out of it. Sometimes more money is coming out. Uh, like the, the, the flow rate is higher, sometimes the flow rate is lower. So we've got a hose with money coming out. So first comment. So in the first place, um, because, because we're sort of talking about a physical situation now, the independent variable is now going to be time instead of x. So the, in, the independent variable is going to be t. So this is the t axis. And let's say that this is some specific time, capital T. So notice that <coughs> capital T is some specific time. That might be something like 24 hours or 12 months or something like that. And let's say that the flow rate looks something like this. Okay. So let's consider. We've got two different points in time. Here's the first point in time. And there's the second point in time. So Corresponding to those two points in time is a flow rate, that and that. What does it mean that this, that the, that the flow, the rate, at this time is less than the rate at that time? What does that mean? How do you interpret that in terms of a business? Yeah, it's like less customers are, are, are presently requesting transactions at the register. So this means that here you're making some amount of money, and just to, just to put a definite number on it, maybe we're making three monies. <laughs> three monies at that 
at that instant in time. And then uh, here, maybe we're making seven monies. <laughs> so seven, seven currency units per time units. Three currency units per time units. So that would be like, to, to, to give a hydraulic analogy, a water analogy, this would be like, yeah, the water's flowing out. It is. Uh, but at this point in time, the water's flowing out even more. Okay? Even faster. Okay, so a higher rate means that, 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 the, that the money flow is, is higher. Two. Suppose that the flow looks like this. Something like that. Okay, so now let's select two points in time. So for example, this point in time and this point in time. So two points in time. So now, thi from this point on the graph anyway, you've got to go down to get to there. Okay. And then from this point, you've got to go up to get to there. So now, just like the previous, just like the previous uh, example, this point is lower than that point which means that at this point in time, we're making more money per unit time than we are making at this point. But what does it mean that this point is below the axis? That means you're losing money. That's what that means. So that, that could mean something like, like to make the Walmart analogy again, that could mean something like, well, yes, we are making some transactions, but they're just sort of trickling in because most people are sleeping. And we're paying a whole bunch of people to get the store ready for tomorrow. They're restocking the shelves, cleaning it, whatever. And all those people are getting paid, uh, but we're not making that many sales. So in fact, revenue minus cost is negative presently. That's what that means. And here, revenue minus cost you know, the instantaneous revenue, marginal revenue minus marginal cost is positive. Okay, so, so this is a place where you're losing money. This is a place where you're losing money. This is a place where you're making money. Okay. <clears throat> so now, you're losing money in this, in this, in this region of time. Is this a business that you would just give up on and say, forget it, I don't want anything to do with that business because look, they're losing that money right there. Not with that <laughs> right, right? So then, but wait, but wait, they're losing money here and they're losing money there. Right, so then, so then, here's the question. Suppose you have a money flow. F of t on the time interval zero to big T. What's the total money flow? So specifically, I want you to give me a formula. And now, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. I might be putting words in your mouth, so tell me if I don't have it right. I think you're saying that, well, yes, during this part of the day, we're losing money. I agree with that. But I'm not so concerned about the fact that I'm losing money there at this time of the day, because I'm making money at this time of the day, and the amount of money that I make during the profitable part profitable part of the day far exceeds the amount of money that I lose during the losing part of the day, so I'm still perfectly happy to stay in business. Okay?
Okay. So what is, how do you calculate the total amount of money? How do you get it? What does that mean, the, the top? The top what? Uh huh. Ah, so you're saying it's the area that ends up mattering, right? It is the area that ends up mattering. Because remember, what this is, this represents the amount of currency per unit time. So, for example, if, if it so happened that you were making $10 an hour for 20 hours, how much money did you make? 200, right? And how did you come up with that? Yeah, you just multiplied it out, right? 10 per hour multiplied by 20 hours, okay? So we could break this, this area into little rectangles, and then each little rectangle would represent a slice of money, and then we could add them all up. Well, the total money flow is the integral from 0 to t, big T, of f of little t, d little t. So that's the total money flow. So in the end, the calculus way to say, the, to say that yes, I would like to have this business is that, well, when I integrate the money flow over, if this is a, if this is a one day period, when I integrate the money flow over this one day period, it's positive. So yeah, yeah, I would like to stay in business, right? It's not really that disturbing to me, the fact that I'm losing money in the middle of the night. Okay, so let's have such an example. Consider the money flow Consider the money flow F of T is seventy five thousand T on the interval zero to three where T is in years. I want you to find the total money flow. So what am I asking you to do? So I'm, so I'm just saying that, okay, well, <clears throat> in the end, I'm asking you to compute this integral. So integral, what are the limits? Zero to three. And then what are we integrating? Mm -hmm, 75,000 T dt. <clears throat> So what this is saying, this is saying something like, uh, when we suppose that this is our business, we open it up, and at the, at the instant that we open it up, at time zero, we're, our money flow is zero. We're not making any money at that instant. But then the amount of money that we're making slowly is going up. Slowly, is go slowly going up, and at the end of the first year, we're making $75,000 a year. How much are we making at the end of the second year? 150,000 dollars a year. And then at the end of the third year, we're making 225,000 dollars a year. But all the time, as time is progressing, we're making a little bit more money per unit time all the time. So the question is, is how much money do we accumulate? 
Well, the answer is this integral. So that'd be 75,000 t squared over 2 from 0 to 3. <coughs> so 75,000 over 2 is 37,500 uh, t squared 0 to 3. So that'd be 37,500 times 9 minus 0. So that's 337,500. So 337,500 dollars. Okay? That, that's the total amount of money that we would make supposing that our money flow was given by 75,000 T on the interval 0 to 3. So what this is conceptually to make a hydraulic analogy a water analogy, it would be like, it would be like we had a water hose, okay, a water hose, and then money's coming out of it, right, little, little money's are all flowing out of it. And they're all falling into a big hole. And then we we just do this for the whole for for all of the 3 years. And then we count it all up and all after all the money is just we're just pouring it into the hole. $337,500. So does everybody, everybody get the idea? So now, <clears throat> here's a question. Is that, so, so notably, this is not really the way, <laughs> right? People just don't take their money and then, or, or at least, you know, clever people. They don't take their money and just, just put it in a hole, right? At the, you know, most businesses somehow route that money back into research and development or, 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 what, or expansion or what have you. Or at the very minimum, if they're not doing any R&D and if they're not doing any expansion, then at the very minimum, they're going to put it in a bank account, right? <laughs> so that at least it would accrue some interest. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this scenario, we're going to take this water hose that's currently pointed at a hole in the ground, <laughs> And we're going to consider, well, what if we started to try to redirect things and consider things in the context of interest? Okay? So in order to uh, address that, I need to remind you of some things you learned in college algebra. So this is the present and future value. <clears throat> okay. So here's my, uh, here, here's a question that we're going to consider. So let's say that you've won a prize. You've won a prize. And you have two options for your receipt of the prize. You can either take $80 here and now, or you can have $95 one year from now. So the question is, which do you prefer? It depends on, <laughs> it depends on how broke you are. Okay. Well, what I want you to see is that you've got two amounts of money, 80 and 95. Now, 95 is clearly more than 80. But the time at which you have access to this money is different. One of them is right now, 
at the present time, and the other one is at, at the future, one year from now. So you've got two different values of two different quantities of money, but they're separated by an interval of time. And the question is, is how do they compare? And what we're going to the way we're going to answer it is is as the following. So supposing that for in the case of ninety-five dollars, we wouldn't be able to access it. Uh, if we took the $95 offer for one year. So suppose that we took the 80 right now and we put it into an interest-bearing account and we also didn't touch it. Then that $80 would move forward in time, gaining interest. And now the question is, is well, how would that compare to the $95, right? So, and the reason why we're going to consider the question that way is that now we'll have two dollar amounts, but at the same time, we'll be able to make a decision. Okay, I can either take the 95 one year from now, or I can take the 80 now, put it in an account, and then withdraw it one year from now, and I want to know which one is better. Does everybody understand the idea? Okay. So, uh, the model is this. So this is a model that you are already familiar with. This is called the continuously compounding interest formula. <clears throat> there are four parameters. A, this is the account balance at time t <clears throat> and noti notably this is at some time t that's almost always construed in the future so a, a, a very common name for a is the future value This is the account balance at t equals zero. So this very often is called the principal, but because it is at time t is equal to zero, it is also called the present value. R, this is the uh, interest rate and then T is time. So now you know two compound interest models. You know the discrete compounding one, and you know the continuously compounding one. This is the continuously compounding one. Okay, so then what relates all these together is the PERT formula. A is P multiplied by E to RT. However, now that we have this and we're starting to think about money moving through time, not only are we going to want to be able to move money forward through time, but we're also going to be able to, we're also going to want to be able to move money backwards through time. So algebraically that means we're going to want to solve for P, the present value. So what would you get if you solved for P? What would you have to do?
you'd have to divide, right? So P is A divided by exponential RT. So that's true. That's true. However, uh, that's not typically the way it is written. Rather, this exponential is moved to the numerator, but what's the algebraic cost of moving it to the numerator? What do you have to do to get it to move up? Yeah, you negate the exponent. So P is A exponential negative RT, which doesn't have quite as cute of a name, right? This one's called the PERT formula. And I guess this one's called the other one, right? <laughs> it doesn't have a nice name. Okay, so let's consider that question that I said. Would you rather have 80 now, or would you rather have 95 a year from now? So of course it depends on the interest rate, right? So, let's say, um, would you rather eighty dollars now or ninety five dollars one year from now assuming we'll go full credit card here we'll say assuming 18% interest, because <laughs> why not? Well, there's two ways to solve this question. Um, one of the ways, we'll, we'll do it one way. We'll take the $80 and we'll move the $80 forward in time. So we'll move the $80 forward to one year. So that is to say, we want to calculate the future value of eighty dollars at one year. Okay. And those those folks are really going at it, aren't they? Okay. <clears throat> so we've got A, P, R, and T. So those are the parameters in the model. For this question to be a legitimate question, I must have given you three of them and be asking you to find the other one. So, uh, so how about A? Are we looking for that or do we have that? So which one is it? We're looking for it. We're looking for it because it says calculate the future value. And the future value is A. So this is what we are, this is what we are to find. Okay, how about P? P is 80. Okay, what's R? So remember, R must be expressed as a decimal, so 0 0.18. And then what's T? One year. So taking those together, A is, uh, what, A is 80 times the exponential of uh, 0 0.18 times 1. Okay, so then now 
you let the calculator do its thing. So 80 times the exponential of 0 0.18. So it's $95 and 78 cents. So what does that mean? And what bearing does that have on the answer to the question? So, so what's the answer to the question? Would you rather have 80 now? Or 95 in a year. Take the 80, right? Because we gotta we gotta have that 78 cents, right? <laughs> we gotta gotta have it. Okay. So what that's saying is that you had two different amounts of money, and they were separated in time. What this calculation did is it moved them to the same point in time, but it, it gets moved through an interest-bearing situation. Okay, so we, we moved both, we made it to where both sums, both, both amounts were at some future time. So now we're going to solve this exercise in a different way. Now we're going to solve it by saying, well, let's, instead of moving the 80 forward through time, let's move the 95 backwards through time. Let's move the 95 backwards through time. How much would $95 that I only have access to one year from now be worth if I could pull it back to right now. So we're going to move the 95 backward uh, backward uh, one year. That is to say, we're going to calculate the present value. Of ninety-five dollars, uh, which is accessible. one year from now. So again, there's four parameter parameters in the model, A, P, R, and T. And it must be the case that I gave you all but one. So how about A? Do, is that what we're finding, or is that what we know? It's what we know. We know we're taking that future value of $95 and we're bringing it back. So we know that future value is 95. What about P? This is what we're finding. How about R? Still 0 0.18. And then T? Still 1. Now, which formula are we going to use? In the end, they're equivalent, right? But I'll use that one since it's already, already there. So P is uh, then 95 exponential of negative 0 0.18 times 1. Okay, so then plug that into the machine. And my calculator is telling me that this is 79.35. So what bearing does that have on the, on the answer to the exercise? Mm -hmm. Right. 
So what it's saying is that you took these two values of money at different times. We took the $95 that was at the future and we pulled it back to the present. And at the present, it was worth $79.35. So which one do we want? The 80, right? So does everybody see that either point of view is telling you that, that the 80 is the better deal? OK, so now this, this idea of moving money backwards and forwards in time, I hope it's quite clear because now we're about to do it with infinitely many pieces of money. OK? <laughs> So here's the idea. This is called the present value of a money flow. So again, let's do the hydraulic analogy. That is to say, we've, we've got a water hose a hose, and there's literal money coming out of the hose. And let's say that this, this procedure, the, the, this hose money, is currently going into a pit, a pool, and this is occurring over the course of a year. So you've got money coming out during February, you've got money coming out during August, it's, it's just coming out all the time. So here's the question we're going to address is how much money how much money is that is that money flow worth if you were to transport all of that money as it comes out of the hose backwards in time to the beginning of the procedure okay so we take all the little bits of money and transport it back in time so for example in march you know maybe the, maybe the hose uh, maybe the hose lets out $10,000 well, how much money would that be if we took that money and we transported it backwards to January 1 through an interest-bearing account? So that's how we're going to do it. We're going to take the whole interval of time, maybe say it's a year, and we'll break it into months. And we'll say, okay, let's transport all of the, all of the January money back to the first day and all of the February money back to the first day. But the February money has further to go in time. It has to be transported back two months. And then the March money, we're going to transport it all the way back in time. It has to go back three months. The April money has to go back all the way in time. It has to go back four months. Right? So all the money is being transported back in time, and it's all traveling a different distance. And then, you, and then we're going to say, well, month, that's, that's, not, that's not accurate enough. Let's do it every week. Okay, so... <laughs> So then we'll transport all of the money from the 27th week backwards in time 27 weeks. And then, oh, week's not good enough. Let's use, <laughs> let's use days. Days will be better. Oh, days aren't good enough. Let's use seconds. Okay. So suppose we have a money flow. f of t on interval 0 to big T. We're going to do the same thing we always do. We take some function here and we're going to cut the interval in question into pieces now again the same disclaimer as always I drew four pieces but understand this means in pieces so, what is, what is the size of, what are we going to use for the name of the size of every interval? Okay. 
Delta X is a good suggestion. Delta T is a better suggestion. So delta T, right? Because this is cutting up t uh, an interval of time. Uh, so what's going to be the formula for delta T? Remember, it's the, the length of the interval. So what's the length of that interval? T minus 0. And then divided by the number of pieces we want to cut it into, which is n. So T over n. We'll take the similar names for all these things. So this one, we're going to call it T0. This one, we're going to call it Tn. Call it Tn. And then uh, the ith one, Ti. What's the formula for getting to Ti? It's always the same procedure. <laughs> so you can imagine that these are like literal fence posts that you're walking past. They're all evenly spaced. So if I asked you to get to the 37th one, and they're numbered starting with zero. So the zeroth one, the first one, blah, blah. So the way you get to the 37th one is you start there, and then you travel delta t to get to the first one. You travel delta t to get to the next one. You travel delta t to get to the next one. And you just do that 37 times to get to the 37th one. So to get to the ith one, well, you start at T0, and then what? Plus I delta T. Okay, now, in each region, you select a point. So I'll select that one, and... Uh, this one, that one, and that one. The way we're selecting them is not relevant for our class. But what, what that tells you is how high the rectangle is going to be. Okay, so we broke, broke this into n rectangles. Now, what I want you to observe, so this is the plot, this red is the plot of y is f of t. I want you to observe the ith rectangle. So it looks something like this. And we can figure out its dimensions. So what is its base? What's the length of its base? Delta T. They all have that length. Now, what's its height? How tall is the ith rectangle? Well, I guess I left something out. The, na the name for these points that we're selecting, that one is C I. So what's the height of that rectangle? 
not, not quite, not CI, but so this is CI at the point in time. And then what's that height right there? Well, that's the function evaluated at CI, right? The function, right? So this, this height is F of CI. So you could tell me the area of this rectangle. What's the area? It's, right, F of CI delta T, the product of the extents. Okay, so that's its area. But area, that's how we were construing integral when we were doing it abstractly. This is a money problem somehow. This is dealing with money flows and time and things like this. What does this, what kind of thing does this rectangle represent? <coughs> what is it? So again, with the hydraulic analogy, you can imagine that we've got a literal hose with money coming out. And maybe, it, maybe presently the flow rate is $1,000 an hour. $1,000 an hour flowing out of the hose. How much, and supposing that it continues exactly like this, $1,000 an hour, and it does this for three hours. How much money is that? 3,000. And how did you come to that? Yeah, you multiplied it, right? So F of CI, that's money per time. It's the rate at which money is coming out of the hose. Or, if you like, it's the rate at which money is coming into the cash registers, <coughs> or whatever you like. And then delta t, that's an expanse of time. So what I'm telling you is this is like $1,000 per hour for three hours. And the product of these two is 3,000. So that means that this rectangle is money. That's what it is. It's dollars. So this is money because this this is dollars per time that's its unit dollars per time and this one is time <coughs> So what I'm telling you is that all these little rectangles, they represent like packets of money. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this rectangle back to t equal to 0. That is to say that we're going to take the ith rectangle, which is somewhere over here, this is at time ti, and its height is f of ci and its base is delta t we're going to take all of that money and move it backwards in time to t equals zero
That is to say, we're going to ask, what is, the, what is the present value of this much money? This is, just, this is just like taking $95 backwards in time one year. So that's what we're doing. <clears throat> so this has present value. <clears throat> present value what? So how much money is it? It's that much money, right? <clears throat> it's that much money. So f of ci delta t. <clears throat> and we want that money to uh, come back in time. So that means that we're using the p formula. So pi is this. So we need to multiply it by an exponential term. What exponential term? <clears throat> So it'll be exponential of what? Remember, th th this is those two formulas. It's e we're either using the, the A equals P exponential RT, or we're using P is A exponential negative RT. <coughs> so it'll be negative RT. So that's taking this little bit of money backwards in time. So now what I'm saying is that we're, gonna, we're breaking the money flow into n pieces, four in this drawing. And now we're going to take all of the n pieces and we're going to take them backwards in time. And that's how much they'll be worth at that time. So now we're going to take them all back. So each one of them will be taken back. And the names for them are, well, this one is, this one is P1, this one is P2, this one is P3, and this last one, Pn, right? The nth one. And so what I want to know, the question we're trying to address, is if you take all this money back to the beginning, how much money would it be all worth? Which is to say, I'd, I'd give up the hose. I love the hose. Money is just coming out of the hose. The hose is terrific. But I'd give it all up right now if I knew how much money it would give me and I could transport it back in time and just have the lump sum right now. For those of you who play the lottery, it's kind of like, do you want, to do you want the, the payout option or the cash option? Right? Which is to say, do you want a big lump sum once or do you want to get paid a bunch of little sums periodically. So we take all these rectangles back and sum them up. 
you get the sum from 1 to n of pi. But we have a formula for pi, right? In terms of f and delta t and all of that. So this is the sum from i is 1 to n of f of ci delta t times the exponential of negative r ti. <coughs> On this previous page, I left off an i here. So that i I just wrote. Okay, then I'll make one slight modification uh, in the formulas that you're about to have to get accustomed to. This exponential is written in front of the F, so I'm going to move it over. So this is an approximation. For the present value of the money flow. It's just an approximation because it's telling you what it would be if you were to break the money flow, say, into 12 rectangles, you know, one for every month. But if, if 12 rectangles is not accurate enough, what, how could you improve the result? More rectangles, right? And if that wasn't enough, more rectangles. And the calculus point of view is? Yeah, there's never enough. Let's just use infinitely many rectangles, okay? So to get the exact answer, you let n go to infinity, the same way we always do. So the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i is 1 to n of exponential negative r ti times f of ci delta t. And here we have the same joke that we've been making all semester, right? In the limit, the Greek letters become the Latin letters. Ha ha. So this is integral now. And then what are the limits of integration? Zero to big T. So 0 to big T, exponential negative RT, R little t, F of little t, uh, D little t. Okay. Wow. So now the concept of watching, watching the money flow being broken into pieces and then transporting the individual pieces backwards in time. It's very important for you to get that concept, but I'm not going to ask you to reconstruct this formula. In the end, what you need to know is that this is the present value of a money flow. the present value of the money flow. <clears throat> That's taking all the little bits of money, transporting them backwards in time to the beginning. So let's take that same example. That is to say, we did an example, and I actually compute the total value of the money flow. Right 
somewhere. Right here. So I gave you this example. I said, here's the money flow, here's the interval, find the total value. You did it. Okay, now what we're gonna do is I want you to find the present value of that same money flow. So, consider the money flow Same one as before, f of t is 75,000 t on the interval 0 to 3. <clears throat> I want you to find its present value. Now, before we answer the question and come to a numeric answer, I have a question for you. The total money flow is $337,000. That's if we were doing this, right? Just take the, just take the, the money hose and just, just put it into the pool there. And just let it accumulate right there. So this value, the present value of that, are we expecting this number to be more, less than, the same, or unknown versus the total value? So find the present value, and we're going to say that the, this is something I left out, interest rate. It's zero to six, right? Zero to three. So, are we expecting the, the number to be? Well, there, for this one, there's no interest. This is just, this is like, this would be like Walmart. If they had, all of, if they had a little tube on, in, the, in all of their cash machines, in all of their registered machines, and they just put all the money in the tube, and then it's just accumulating in a big pool in the back. Just, just being... <laughs> pneumatically pumped. Okay. Let me ask a different question. I think less. So let me, let me ask a, a, a simpler question. When we were talking about the, would you rather have 80 now or 95 a year from now? When you transport 80 forward in time, will the result be more or less than 80? It'll be more. When you transport 80 forward in time, it'll be more. When you transport 95 backward in time, will the result be more or less? Less, right? Because when, the, when money's moving backwards in time, it gets smaller when money moves backwards in time. By the, and that's just, the symmetry of the fact that when money moves forward in time, it gets bigger. So what I want you to see is that the total money flow is 337,000-ish. The present value of that money flow, it simply must be less. It must be less. The present value of that money flow is not exactly, but it's something like saying that I would like to be in control of the hopes. I see that you're in control of the hose, but I want to be in, in control of the hose because I would like to have it. How much money could I give you right now so that I can be in control of the hose? Well, I should be able to give you less than $337,000 because you could take whatever I give you and put it in a bank account. Okay? So, what do we need to do to calculate this answer? Yeah, <laughs> plug it into the formula. Okay, so the formula is uh, zero, just copying it from the previous page, zero to big T 
exponential negative r little t f of little t dt. So that's the formula from the previous page. <coughs> Uh, so what are the, in this exercise, what are the limits of integration? Zero to three. Uh, and then exponential negative, how do we write that interest rate? 0 0.08 uh, T and then multiplied by 75,000 T dt. Okay, so is there any question why this is, in the end, that's what this exercise is requesting of you? Okay. <clears throat> so it's an integral. We'd love to use the fundamental theorem. That'd be terrific. So let's go through the uh, anti-differentiation procedure. So is this exactly one of the three antiderivatives that we know? It isn't. Um, okay, can we do some kind of algebraic simplification? We cannot. Because this is a polynomial, 75,000 t, and that's an exponential, and polynomials and exponentials don't simplify. Okay, so we can't simplify. Uh, can we do a substitution? No, substitution's not going to work. So where, where does that leave us? Which one is it? We want to use the fundamental theorem, I agree, but there's one more technique that we haven't named yet. So if you can't figure out a substitution, what's the next step? By parts. So that means that we need to categorize the different parts here. So what in the integration by parts heuristic, in that acronym or whatever, what kind of thing is this one called? Yeah, this is an exponential part. And what kind of thing is this one? Which one? So there's three, there's three choices. Yes, yeah, the A one. It's algebraic because it's a because it's a polynomial. Okay. So then, what does that tell us about this, about you? Which one is going to be you? The A1. So U is 75,000 T, and then DV is always everything else. Okay, then the right hand side of by parts has four pieces. We currently have two, but we can use these two to find the other two. What, what other piece can we find from U? DU. So then DU is 75,000 DT. And then from V, from DV, we can get V. So what is the antiderivative of that? Very good. Okay, so that's the, that's all the uh, pieces we need. So now the right-hand side of by parts, when it's integration by parts, is uv evaluated from 0 to 3 minus integral 0 to 3 v du. So that's the, that's the right-hand side. 
So now we just need to put in all the, all the pieces. So UV, 75,000 uh, T, exponential <coughs> negative 0 0.08 T over negative 0 0.08 from 0 to 3, minus VDU, <clears throat> okay. So this thing on the left is just an evaluation, so that's just plugging stuff in, that's calculator work. Uh, but this, how about this? Do we know how to do that? Is that something doable? Yeah, I think, because 75,000, that's just a constant. Right? And then division by 0 0.08, that's also just some constant. So all that constant stuff can be taken out of the integral, and the only thing that remains is that exponential. Can you, can you anti-differentiate that exponential thing? Sure you can. Okay, so I'll perform a bunch of simplifications. So I'll do 75,000 divided by 0 0.08, and then I'll use this negative right here to switch the order of evaluation from it's currently 0 to 3 and I'll make it 3 to 0 to get rid of that negative. So 75,000 <coughs> divided by 0 0.08 is 937500 And then I'll divide that 75,000 by that, and I'll cancel these two negatives, those two negatives to make it plus integral 0 to 3, <coughs> 9, 3, 7, 5, 0, 0, exponential negative 0 0.08 TDT. And then <clears throat> nine three seven five hundred T exponential negative zero point zero eight T three to zero and then what? Plus <clears throat> nine three seven five hundred exponential negative 0 0.08 t over negative 0 0.08 from 0 to 3. So from here, this is just calculator work. So you should, you should do that in your own time to make sure that you can come to the right answer. But if you carefully do the boring calculator work, uh, then you'll get 288,064, rounded to the nearest dollar. So those Zs are us leaping through that boring part. <clears throat> so, as for this dollar amount, 288,000, is that a reasonable amount of money for, for this question? Does that make sense in light of our previous knowledge? Okay, if no, then why not? Okay, so so you're saying that so you're saying that it is a reasonable number. 
Yeah, I agree. So what this is saying, let's compare these two numbers. So, so that's the end of the question. But here we've got this number, 288064. And then we had this other uh, number, 337500. This is the amount of money, if you just take the, the money hose and you just pour it into a big pool for the whole year or whatever, the whole interval of time, you'll have $337,000. This, this is how much money, if you take all the money as it, even the instant it's coming out of the hose and transport it back to the present time. So. This is how much money you'd have at the end of the year, but you only get it as the year is unfolding. So you, like this, this month is June. You can't have September's money yet. You can't have it. And you can't have November's money and December's money, you can't have it. You have to wait in due course. What this is saying is that if you were to have all of that money right now, this is how much money it's worth right now. Okay, so any question about that? <clears throat> and so now here's an even better idea. Rather than saying, rather than taking all of our money and putting it in a, in a big hole in the ground, and rather than trying to say, how much money would I take for, the, for, the, for control of the money hose, uh, if you were to give me the money right now, let's, let's be clever and do the thing that people usually do, and that is take the money and don't put it in a hole, of the, hole in the ground, rather deposit it in an account so that it, at least it, 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 uh, it accrues interest, right? So at least you're getting interest on it. So now what we're going to imagine is that at each moment in time, as it unfolds, the money is now not is connected to a bank. And as soon as the money gets into the bank account, then it starts accumulating money. So that means that the money that we get early, it's accumulated money the longest. Right? So if, if we're talking about a year, the money that you get in January, it's going to accumulate money for about 12 months, accumulate interest for about 12 months. Whereas the money that you get in November, it's only going to accumulate money for um, close to a month, right? So the amount of money getting put into the account is going to accumulate money, accumulate interest for different amounts of time. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're going to see how to do that. And thankfully, this this one is actually mathematically very simple. <clears throat> because it, it uses a cute little trick. So this is the future value. Of a money flow. <clears throat> future value of a money flow. And conceptually, this is like taking the money hose and directing it into a bank. <clears throat> So consider that you have money flow f of t on the interval 0 to big T with interest rate r. And we want to know the future value. Well, I know that you may be nervous to see me drawing this diagram for the fourth time today or whatever, but in the first place, it's the last time I'll draw it today, and actually there's a cute little trick that makes it easy. 
So we're going to take this money flow. I'm going to cut it into pieces, just like we've done. We're going to approximate each one of those pieces with a rectangle. And just like we, when, when we were trying to find the present value, we're going to transport each piece backwards in time to time zero. So we're going to take this piece and transport it backwards in time. Take this piece, transport it backwards in time. This piece, backwards in time. So remember, the names of the, this is using all the same names from the previous diagram. We called this one P1, that amount of money P1. This amount of money will be P2, P3, and Pn, the last one. And so now what we're going to do, we're going to ask, well, for example, with, with this amount of money P2, we took it from, from this time and then transport it backwards in time. But what if we were to take that much money and deposit it now into an account and ask what is its future value at the end? Right, so how can we compute the future value? So this is, this is the question from the beginning when I was saying, well, what's the future value of $80? And the answer was something like $95.78. So now I'm going to ask, what's the future value of all of these? What's the future value of all of these? Which is to say, we're going to take P1, and we're going to transport it forward in time. We're going to take P2, transport it forward in time. Take P3, transport it forward in time. <clears throat> and take the last one. <clears throat> and transport it forward in time. So they're all being transported forward now, all these little pieces. Well, that means that we need the future value formula. So remember, there's two, there's two formulas. There's the, there's the A equal to P exponential RT, and there's P is equal to A exponential negative RT. So what we want is we want this one. So A is the future value. <coughs> So this one will give us a 1, and this one a 2, a 3, and this one a n, right? <clears throat> but we can use that formula because after all, we know what the p ones, we know the formula for the pi's. The pi from the previous work we established its formula was <clears throat> what? f of ci delta t times the exponential of negative r little ti. That's the formula for pi. And then we can get a, we can get a um, <clears throat> by, by doing this to it. So A, this would be P, so A1 is P1 
exponential r. And now the question is, I have to I have to write a value here which says how far in time I'm moving it forward. How far in time are we moving it forward? Because remember, P1 is sitting here now at time zero. How far forward do we need to move it? How far does it go? It's sitting here. And it needs to go all the way to big T, right? To the end. So <clears throat> this is a big T. So I'm writing it in red so you don't miss that that's a big T and not a little t. So similarly, this one is P2 exponential r big T P3 exponential r big T Pn exponential r big T <clears throat> so to get the future value the approximation of the future value you just have to sum up all of these individual future values you just add them all up <clears throat> So the approximation the approximate future value is the sum from i is 1 to n of all those pieces ai But then we can start using all these formulas. So for example, the sum from i is 1 to n of, uh, so I'm going to write this exponential and that uh, p in the other, in opposite order, like this, exponential r big T uh, pi. So now, <coughs> Here's something that you may not be entirely accustomed to. So just like constants can come out of integrals and antiderivatives, they can be factored out. This e to r big T is constant with respect to i. So this e to exponential r big T can come out of the sum like this. Okay, so I pulled that out, but now what I want you to see is that this right here is the sum of all the present values. That's the sum of all the present values. So that means that is 1 to n of what? Mm. So exponential negative r little t i f of c i delta t. That's a mouthful, isn't it? <clears throat> so that's the approximate future value. That's, for example, we can approximate the future value by breaking the interval into 12 pieces. Like if it's a year, we can do it by months. We take, we take the individual months, we transport them back in time to get the present value, to get the, the value at time zero, and then transport them to the future <clears throat> to get the future value. And then if 12 is not enough 
if 12 pieces doesn't give you enough accuracy, then maybe you could do it every week. So you could use 52 pieces. And if 52 pieces is not accurate enough, maybe you could use 366 pieces. But since this is a calculus course, we're going to use infinitely many pieces and get the exact answer. That is to say, we're going to let n go to infinity. So the formula is then exponential r big T integral 0 to big T exponential negative r little t f of t dt. So there's the formula for the future value. Now you might be a little concerned when you look at this and say, wow, that's another, another formula. But what I'd like for you to observe is that it is literally just this. What happens if I take that away? So I'm obscuring something now. Then what is that? That's the present value. So if I, if I obscure that piece, that's the present value. To get the future value, you multiply by that. So that's nice. That's nice. So now, for that same money flow that we've been talking about, 75,000 T, let's find, let's find its future value. <clears throat> Consider the money flow. f of t is 75,000 t on the interval 0 to 3 with interest rate eight percent find the future value Well, that means I want you to use that formula there. So that's exponential r big T integral 0 to big T exponential negative r little t <coughs> f of little t d little t. And you might think, oh, I don't want to do another integral. But in fact, this question is almost trivial. Why is this question almost trivial now? So why is this one easy? We can do this one like in just, once you understand how to do it, you can really do it in about 20 seconds. They don't cancel. They don't cancel. The observation is, is that if I cover this up, what is this? That's the present value. And the observation is, well, we already calculated the present value, didn't we? Yeah, so we just have to take that present value, 288,000, whatever, whatever and multiply it by that. That's all that's necessary for this one. So then it will be exponential, uh, what, 0 0.08 times 3, and then multiplied by that number we found, 288064. <coughs> so that's job for a calculator. And my calculator is telling me 
366201. Round it to the nearest dollar. <clears throat> so, is that a reasonable number for, for this? Let's think about it. So that's the answer to the question. But I, what I want you to see is that there's three conceptual things occurring here. <clears throat> there's three conceptual things occurring here. It is, you've got a hose with money coming out of it. You can just take this hose and, and direct it into a large swimming pool. That you, it, it would fill up the swimming pool with money and you'd have some amount of money after doing it. So when we did that for this particular money flow, we got 337,500. This is the total money flow. Now, when we said, okay, let's imagine taking all of the bits of money and transporting them back to the beginning of the process. So the stuff that comes, the stuff that comes uh, in the middle, it's got, a, it's got a middle amount of distance to go. The stuff that, go, that comes out at the end, it's got a long distance to go back through history. So in doing that, the amount of money that we got was 288064. This is called the present value. Of the money flow. And then we said, well, and what if we were to take that present value and deposit it in a bank account? which is conceptually identical to saying that what if we just took the hose and put the hose directly into a bank account? We got the value 366201. So this is the future value. Of the money flow. So do, do notice these numbers. Notice that this one is the smallest, this one is the middle, and this one is the largest. It must be this way because this, this is what's happening when, you have, when you're considering no interest whatsoever and you're just accumulating money over a large expanse of time, as if you had a money hose pouring into a swimming pool. This is is what you would say that, yeah, I'll let you have the money hose in the swimming pool if you'll give me this much money right now. I'll trade. Okay, and then this is how much money you would have if you kept the hose for yourself and instead of putting it into a swimming pool, you put it into a bank. So these numbers are in this order. So on, on a particular uh, so let's write down the formulas for these. So we're almost done, which is good because I'm getting kind of exhausted. So this is the formula for this one. Okay, the formula for this one is 0 to t exponential negative r little t f of t dt. And this one is exponential r big t integral of 0 to big T, e to negative r little t, f of t, dt. So when I give you a money flow problem, I will always ask for all three of these. I'll ask for the total value, the present value, and the future mm -hmm. value. I'll ask for all three. The reason is because this one is usually very easy to do. This one usually is a moderate amount of work. But then once you do this one, this one is trivial because it's just this one times one more number. So you can always find these. So I, I will ask you for all three. 
Now, the very worst thing that you can do on, on such an exercise is, tell, is give me numbers where they're not in the right order. Right? They have to be in this order. So, it would be like saying that, if, if they're not in this order, it would be like saying something like, okay, I'll put my $80 into the bank account, and in one year, I check the balance, and it is 60. Well, that's not the way banks work, right? You, you don't lose money as a result of putting something into an interest-bearing account. Alternatively, to, if these are in the wrong order, that's like saying that, okay, I could take my money, hose, and I could accumulate a million dollars over a course of a year. So maybe a, a million dollars pours out of the hose and over the course of one year. Uh, would you then, if someone had such a hose, would you say, I'll give you two million dollars for that hose <laughs> for one year? No, it doesn't make sense. You have to give them less. Good, so any questions about any of this? Okay, so have a nice weekend.